On this edition of the Nesson Red Sox podcast, we'll give our picks for who we believe is Boston's real MVP this season, Mookie Betts or J.D. Martinez. And we'll look at this Red Sox team and see how it stacks up against some of the better teams in recent Red Sox memory. And it might be better than you think. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Nesson Red Sox podcast. I'm Ricky Doyle, joined as always by Dakota Randall. Dakota, uh, how you doing? Doing well. Doing well. How you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. Great. Ready for uh, another exciting edition of the Nesson Red Sox. Podcast. Well, I was gonna say we're. Uh, it's kind of the same old, same old story here. Right. Um, we deserve immense credit for coming up with things to talk about on a weekly basis because <laughs> this team gives you practically nothing. It continues to roll. Um, last week when we sat in here, we discussed uh, really our takeaways from their sweep over the Yankees, and they've since uh, continued to just win baseball games. Uh, Red Sox, as of this recording, on uh, Wednesday, August the, uh, what, what is today? Right. 15th, 15th, whatever. Yeah. Uh, this is, wow, summer's flying. Uh, Red Sox, 86 in 35, 10 games ahead of the Yankees, uh, who are the second best team in baseball really just solidifying themselves as a MLB powerhouse at this point. Um, that s- happened a while ago, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, they just continue really to I think it's more, to at this point, it's more, it's more blatantly clear that they're the, they're the best team in baseball. True. And you know, we were kind of jockeying between that all season. Is it the Astros? Is it some other team? I think at this point, in terms of regular season, it's, it's pretty, pretty darn clear. Well, it is, and it's interesting, too. It's kind of, finally, it's being reflected in the, the World Series odds as well. I think it was, as of... Uh, Tuesday, the, the, the new odds came out, and uh, Bovada had them as the favorites in the World Series. Right. Uh, also, obviously, the favorites to win the American League. So. And I disagree with the those hype points, is but building. we'll get to that later. I disagree with what? The being a World Series favorite, but we'll, okay. we'll get to that. Interesting. We will get to that. Uh, well, we can start off a number of ways here, but rather than focusing on the games that we've you know witnessed since the that Yankee series. Uh, I mean, wh- I don't even really see the point in doing that because it was, you know, you took two or three from the Blue Jays and then swept the, the hapless Orioles yeah. uh, four games over the weekend and then took the series open against the Phillies. But, I mean, not, not, to, not to take anything away from the O's. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, but at least they simultaneously put a, take everything away from them. At least they the put up a fight, put up a better fight than the Yankees, you could argue. True. But, I don't know, I, I think we should start with, I guess, what is becoming the the main uh, discussion surrounding this team around this area being the, the kind of the MVP chase. Right. Um, you know, Mookie Betts versus J.D. Martinez because it's pretty clear at this point uh, that these two both have a viable case uh, to be considered the American League MVP this season. Uh, even more so now with Mike Trout on the disabled list, and you know that kind of I think takes him out of the running probably. Especially yeah. with what's going on in Cleveland. So at this point, I think it's 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 pretty clear it's a three three man race between three, yeah. Martinez, Betts, and Jose Ramirez in Cleveland. So, all right. So what, let's just let's let's get into it. I mean, if you're you're standing here after, you know, we still got keep in mind about a, a month and a half left in the regular season for things to change. But as you assess this team. Who is who's your MVP, and and then also as the follow up, I mean, do you think one of these guys from the Red Sox, either Mookie Betts or J D Martinez, ultimately wins the American League MVP? Um, so, we, I've heard people talk about this, and I've heard some say that, I've heard some people say that uh, Mookie Betts is the is the American League MVP, but J D Martinez really is the team MVP, and I've heard a lot of people scoff at that notion, saying you know if you're one, you you should be the other. And I actually agree that I believe, you know, if, if everybody kind of continues at the current pace, unless J.D. Martinez, like, has a monster September, maybe beats David Ortiz's single season record for the Red Sox, he gets up around 55 homers. If that happens, I, and especially if he wins a triple crown, which is going to be tough. Uh, but aside from that, um, I think Mookie Betts probably should be uh, the, the American League MVP. Uh, just because, you know, his overall numbers, he is batting 350. You know, he's doing it all at the leadoff spot. He kind of does everything for that team. And then especially, you know, we've seen MVP voters have had a bias against guys that don't play a ton of defense. And J.D. Martinez primarily has been a DH, and he's obviously nothing to write home about as an outfielder. I think he's slightly better than many gave him credit for when he arrived with the Red Sox. But all in all, you know, you don't think about him and his defense. So I think ultimately the overall body of work and as an overall player, I think Mookie Betts 
uh, will get the MVP. And also because it really is, the, the MVP is so about stats. I mean, Trout wins it every year primarily because of OPS and war. And, you know, we, we can argue about whether that's fair or not. I personally think it's kind of dumb. But, you know, MVP voters typically go with the stats. And overall, stats and defense. And Mookie Betts is going to have the better overall stats if you look at everything, um, if you factor in stolen bases, average, all that stuff runs, and he plays better defense. However, I don't really think there's, you, you can say anybody is the MVP of the Red Sox other than J.D. Martinez. I mean, this team is on, what, uh, on pace to win 20-something more games than they did last season. Um, and when you just watch the game, and I know we argue about whether or not the eye test is, is the real test, but to me, you watch this team, and it's abundantly clear the difference this guy makes in the lineup. I mean, a perfect case for me is the game against the Orioles. I can't remember if it was... Well, you just see the year-over-year -year production. Yeah. and it, if, I mean, that this offense has produced, and then how certain guys individually have produced, uh, and you, that you can make the case that it's because J.D. Martinez is in that lineup that has that sort of trickle-down effect. Absolutely. And, it, and he's and made bets really better. The, you know, the power element that this team clearly lacked. Right. Uh, you know, since losing David Ortiz. So, yeah, I mean, it's... But I think that, that where J.D. Martinez makes a big difference is if you look at Sunday night's game against the Orioles, where, you know, they came back to tie it. I can't remember if it was Sunday night or Saturday night. But either way, they come back to tie it, and it was I think it was 3-3 three to three in the 7th or the 8th. And it was one of those games where it was kind of grinded out. Sox weren't doing much to, to, to generate runs, and it kind of looked like it was, you know, going to head to extra innings. And last season's team, as soon as the Orioles tied that game, that game probably would have gone into 13, 14 innings, like every game seemingly did last season. And, you know, the Red Sox would have struggled to get, you know, to find a way to break through and win that game. This, this season, I mean, J.D. Martinez comes up in the next inning and it's a two-run home run for a second of the game. And, I mean, he's done that countless times throughout the season where he's, he's come up and, you know, anytime a team has tried to, you know, eat their way back into a game, he's come up and said, no, here's another home run, here's another double to drive in a pair. And I just think the difference, like you said, the trickle-down effect and the difference he's made in the lineup is, you know, it's huge. And to me, I mean, he's clearly the team's MVP. Now, if I'm looking at the American League MVP as a whole, I, I'm, right now I might be leaning towards Jose Ramirez. I mean, he's... 40 steals. He, it, the numbers he's putting up in Cleveland are insane. And, you know, for as good as Francisco Lindor has also been for Cleveland this year, I just think that, you know, he doesn't really have the, the same... It's not like Mookie and JD where it's one and one A. Like I think Ramirez has pretty clearly been their best player this season, so I think he shouldered a little bit more of the load. Um, you could also make the case that the Indians the, have been down and or, or are not as good as they have been in years past, and you can make the case that well, they gotta, where would they be without Jose Ramirez? Well, that's the thing too. I mean, you look at how bad that bullpen has been for the, most of the season, so they haven't really been as well rounded as the Red Sox have been. So they've had to, you know, kind of compensate in other areas. I just think that Jose Ramirez has contributed so much to that. Uh, he's been awesome defensively as well at third base, so I might even, I might give the edge to him in terms of AL MVP. But it's from from the purposes of the, this exercise and that we're focusing on the Red Sox guys, I'm leaning towards Mookie Betts. Uh, okay. it, in spite of everything that you mentioned, and in spite of you know, I agree wholeheartedly that this offense, just the, everything about it, really changed with the addition of JD Martinez. I do put a lot of stock into the fact that uh, of just how well-rounded Mookie is because I, I'm not taking anything away from JD Martinez for, you know, having so many of his games come as the designated hitter or the fact that he does, you know, that the defensive metrics don't paint him in a positive light uh, when he is in the field. Just doing more so that, you know, Mookie Betts isn't just a better base runner than JD Martinez. He's an elite base runner across all of Major League Baseball. Right. He's not just a better defender than J.D. Martinez. He's an elite defensive player across all of Major League Baseball. I mean, that, you're talking about and quite possibly batting average. the second best player in baseball behind Mike Trout. Um, I, I, yeah, higher batting average. Higher OPS. Higher, higher OPS, you know, due in large to you know, the slugging percentages are essentially the same. He's got a much higher on-base percentage. The war, I, I know that, you know, you get into that whole, you get down that, that whole of relying on war and people start to call you the biggest nerd on the planet, but uh, it is significantly higher. I know 7.9, I think 8 is categorized as really an MVP caliber season, and he's right. already at 7.9. I mean, this. I think JD is at like 5.5 or something like it's that. It's 
So it's a pretty significant margin there. And I get it. I know J.D. Martinez has the home runs, the RBI. He has the counting stats, which, one, is a little, you know, he's played 13 more games, so there are more opportunities there. But I'm taking the RBIs out of the equation there because he's had far more opportunities to drive in runs than Mookie Betts, who's a leadoff hitter. I mean, you look at J.D. Martinez, 234 plate appearances with men on base, 141 plate appearances with runners in scoring position. Mookie, on the other hand, 152 plate appearances with men on base, 87 with runners in scoring position. The opportunities have been there. So while J.D. Martinez is racking up those counting stats, it's in large because Mookie Betts is getting on base ahead of him, as well as you know Andrew Benatendi, who's come on strong uh, ever since a little bit of a rough patch at one point there. So I don't know. I, I, to that I would say, though, I would, and I, I agree, Mookie has to get on base for J.D. JD to drive him in, and the fact you know, that, that Mookie is, is setting the table it makes a huge difference. However, I'd say that if it weren't for J.D. Martinez, Mookie Betts wouldn't be hitting leadoff. I mean, he was hitting third last season. He, you know, he messed around in the cleanup spot a little bit, and he's blatantly said he does not like hitting there. And, you know, the fact that he's been able to go up and just stay in the leadoff, in the leadoff, leadoff spot all season is because J.D. Martinez is there. And I know that yeah. you, you can't say, like, then, you know, he's hitting what he's hitting and he's doing what he's doing, but... You know, the simple fact that J.D. Martinez is in the middle of the lineup doing what he's doing allows, like you said, everybody above him to be in their correct spots and to be comfortable and, and, and just, you know, produce because they know they're, they're, there's no shuffling up there. And it's because you finally have a guy in the middle of the order that is, you know, putting up on David Ortiz level numbers. But I, I just look at it in the Mookie Betts' offensive, oh, you know, output compares very favorably with J.D. Martinez before you factor in the defensive and base running aspect of it. Right. Where, like I said, Mookie is head and shoulders above most of Major League Baseball in those categories. I mean, you look, only five outfielders in MLB rank ahead of them in terms of uh, fan graph, uh, fan graphs, like uh, defensive metric that they use. Um, their base running, I mean, only seven players in baseball rank ahead of them. So just, I mean, no matter really how you slice it, whatever you want to look at, whatever facet of the game, Mookie bets just compares very favorably to his you know fellow elite players across baseball and I would also argue that you know as much as this offense has changed with the addition of Martinez and how important he is to the lineup and everything I would you know I would argue that Mookie Betts's contributions are equally as important to the identity of this team which is you know they try to take that extra base sometimes to the detriment um, but just you know very aggressive on the bases I mean you look at his stolen base numbers uh, I can't help but look back to that series against the Yankees when they just completely had their foot on their throat and just was just they, you know they were just running at will and I think it all starts at the top it starts with your leadoff hitter it starts with Mookie Best the base the, you know the best base runner and the probably you know, fastest guy on the team so I think that you know in addition to just you know the the overall offensive skill how good he is from a plate discipline standpoint just the other you know more explosive aspects of this game uh, like you know, like JD's contributions just contribute towards the you know the identity of the offense as a whole. So I'm giving him the slight edge, but again, like I, I don't say that obviously as a slight towards JD. Martinez. No, I know, and, and I, I guess, don't think anybody would take it as that. But no, but I and the, I guess for me too, both players have clearly had calculable impacts on the team. You can look at all the numbers you want, and clearly they make a difference. To me, just th- th- there's a huge, almost incalculable difference that JD Martinez makes, and it's what we talked about: the effect on the lineup. And it's the fact that you have a guy in the middle of the order who there is no, nothing you can do to pitch to him. There's no way to pitch to him. And I'm not saying that there is a way to pitch to Mookie Betts, but there's a difference between, you know, doubles down the line or well, singles to the opposite field. Didn't you identify earlier this year? Well, I don't think this, it's me identifying it. I think it's, they, they cracked the code. I don't think it's me identifying <laughs> anything. I think it's just clear. I think, you know, pitchers, know, like, if you watch. When pitchers pitch to Mookie Betts, when they want to minimize the damage, they give him breaking balls away or pitch outside because, you know, he, he gets pretty pull happy. And even if he, he does hit it the other way, it's usually a single or a double. They know he's not going to hit a home run. When J.D. Martinez comes up, there's nowhere you can pitch him. You just have to hope you don't make a huge mistake or you hope that somehow he doesn't hit it out of the ballpark or maybe it hits the monster on the way up. But it, it doesn't matter if you pitch him inside, outside, high or low. He can hit it out of the ballpark anywhere you pitch him. And we, the, as great as Mookie Betts is, you can't say the same thing for him. And just the fact that you have a guy like that in the middle of the lineup, I mean, like you said, the trickle-down effect, it impacts everybody. Because yeah. nobody wants to pitch that guy. You can't pitch it to him. I just, I, I mean, I, it, 
I know, and I'm not. Try- I know we don't want. It's not like it's a slight against either player. Well, but. I know, it, but uh, like you could also make the case that you know having Mookie on the bases at the clip that he gets on base and the uh, you know just the, you know how frequently he he's running, how frequently he's stealing bases, that that applies pressure in a different way that JD Martinez's presence doesn't apply pressure. You know what I mean? Like, it's I don't just, think it's nearly the same thing. You're, people, teams aren't scared of stolen bases and a guy getting on first and wreaking havoc. They're scared of a guy hitting a three-run bomb, throwing a crooked number up. But you got Mookie Bates on uh, Mookie Bates, Mookie, Mookie Betts Bates. on base. <laughs> Mookie Bates is what I'm sorry, calling him. Uh, you got him on base wreaking a little bit of havoc. I, I, you know, I, I think that that takes away a little bit of your attention to who's at the plate, and in some instances that ends up being JD Martinez. So. I don't think you're so distracted, Mookie Betts on the bases, that it it, it just causes you. Like that, that does I'm playing sense. a little bit of a devil's advocate here, but I know, we're talking I know about some. In the course of talking about very tangible things, we're also adding a, an intangible component. Right, and I'd say JD, Martin, JD Martinez's intangible effect on the team is, I, I would say, vastly greater. Not maybe not vastly greater, but definitely be- greater than Mookie Betts. Yeah, well, what I, mean, we, what I guess we, if you factor you know, in, I mean, there have been I feel like hundreds of stories throughout the course of the season too about how how much. Other players have turned to JD Martinez in terms of like right. Then there's that part of it too. That that should have nothing to do with voting. But that's not going to get into the MVP voting. But it's you know another thing that kind of enhances the narrative, I guess. It might also be a little overrated because I mean Rafael Devers isn't doing much, and Jackie Bradley's the same hitter. So I pre and you know Sandy Leon's still hitting 211. So while I I understand and I appreciate that, I mean everybody else in the lineup largely is doing what they've always done. Which Moreland's hitting 250. Xander Bogarts has more home runs, but he's doing the same thing. So people talk about this huge effect J.D. Martinez has had in the lineup in terms of the coaching and the hitting meetings and all the studying and all the stuff, I guess. But it doesn't. the numbers don't really bear that. So you, if you had an, an AL MVP vote right now, who are you taking? It, factoring in the Jose Ramirez in Cleveland and whoever else you want to throw in that mix. I mean, I mean if someone gave me a vote, I'd say J.D. Martinez. J.D. Martinez. I would say J.D. Martinez, but that's because I look at most valuable player differently than I think a lot of the voters do. I'm one of the people that looks at it as, you know, who was the most valuable to their team and everything that word, you know, could mean. And obviously it's very subjective. Um, You know, if you're looking at just the overall best player and the best numbers, I would say bets. But for me, I look at it as overall value. And again, it's subjective and it's hard to quantify. But for me, I would say J.D. Martinez. Where where it'll really get interesting, too, is if, as you alluded to, if J.D. Martinez somehow, if he goes on a huge run here, overtakes Mookie in terms of batting average and ends up with a triple crown. Right. He's a 333 you've got Mookie's yourself a 350. A, a 2012 situation. Because that's basically what it would be. It would be 2012 all over again in terms of figuring out Miguel Cabrera versus Mike Trout. Uh, Cabrera obviously winning that season uh, in which he won the triple crown. He had uh, 362 points he finished with, 22 first place votes. Trout, on the other hand, had six first place votes. Um, but I just feel like frequently over you know over the last six years or so, given how much of an emphasis has been placed on analytics, I feel like if you had that same MVP voting right now, you're probably getting Mike Trout winning that. Right. Despite the triple crown for Miguel Cabrera. Yeah. I'll Which is, it, it's a, it's a very similar argument that I mean you look at the numbers and Trout just in terms of WAR t- ten. They, war they were doing advanced. They were doing advanced metrics. They were they were paying a lot of it to advanced metrics back when when Cabrera won that too. I think it was just the fact that I agree, but it was the triple crown. It's like how do you not vote for him? And even with you JD don't think Martinez, it's even more analytically driven now. I don't think so. I think it, we we see like a lot more. Even, we see a lot more. You can't even sneeze about without it, somebody talking about the exit velocity out of your nostrils. Right, but I don't you know think I, I mean? I like, uh, exit velocity isn't going to play into any of this. I think you know the main number that people still look at when it comes to MVP voting is WAR. You know, war and OPS and those kind of numbers, and I think they looked at them the same back then. But if JD Martinez, I mean, listen, if, if you win the well, maybe triple, you're just the man ahead of your time, Dakota. Maybe uh, you're just so goddamn smart that you know you're just so ahead of the curve. Uh, that's been suggested. <laughs> but listen, if JD Martinez wins, if you win a triple crown on a team that wins what 115 games, even if you come up like just a few batting average points below the guy that won the batting title. On a team that wins 115 games, you have to win the MVP. Well, that's, a, that's another fascinating element the of it. The point of the game is to score runs and prevent runs. And maybe, is, maybe it makes it a little bit easier that you don't have to pick and choose by how, I mean, I guess we're, we're doing it right now, who's more valuable to the team. But, I mean, like, in the instance of when you have guys on different teams, like the Trout Cabrera instance, you got to you know, you got to factor in Cabrera's supporting cast versus 
uh, trout supporting cast and things like that, which you know it's it, it, it really just adds the whole another layer to the the MVP debate as to whether your team should really factor into it or is it just the best player in the league type of deal. Um, I mean that season the Tigers won the Central. I think they, they won 88 games, uh, won the Central. The Angels. One actually, I think they won eighty nine games, but finished third place in the West, didn't make the playoffs. So, right, there was there was certainly different uh, different elements at play there. Right, and and again, Whereas that's this why is just the same team. So, right, you but that's why disregard it, that. And and that's why you know for me, I, I go back to the whole fact of you know watch the game and who who appears to you as the most viable player, the true biggest game changer. And you know, I'm watching it this season. It's J D Martinez. He's the best hitter in the game. He's made. A world of difference on the Red Sox. He's made all the difference in the world, and he's been the most impactful player in baseball this season. And I think if you go back to that Trout Cabrera year, yes, Trout had all these great advanced metrics. But if you watch those games, and God forbid you have an argument that doesn't have numbers attached to it, you know, God forbid you formulate opinion without statistics. You know, they, they don't tell the whole story. And if you watch those games, it was clear to everybody watching that Miguel Cabrera was the baddest dude in the league that season. It wasn't even close. I don't care about all this other stuff Mike Trout did. Miguel Cabrera impacted <laughs> those games in a way that Mike Trout was not and that nobody did that season. I mean, he was You couldn't pitch to him. It was unreal what he was doing then. People forget. I mean, yeah. you, you just also, watch it. And from who, a Tiger who, standpoint, it, you know, it did help that they had an, an unbelievable pitching staff. But right. When those teams came into the park, who scared you more? As a Red Sox fan, Miguel Cabrera or Mike Trout? And I, if you're, yeah, if you say Mike Trout, I think you're lying. Maybe. Just like if if the Red Sox go into another park and the opposing team thinks, you know, which player are we most afraid of in this series? It's gonna be J.D. Martinez. Absolutely. I know. I'm not saying they're not afraid of Mookie Betts, but I'm saying yeah. you're the you're more concerned about. It's closer than you think. I don't know because you're more concerned about J.D. Martinez because you're like, we can't let that guy hit a three-run home run and screw up this game because he can't. And then your pitcher's out early and all this stuff, and it just makes such a bigger bigger difference than a double to lead off the game. So what is it about uh, Jose Ramirez that kind of sets you back a little bit in terms of, you know, why would you pick Martinez? I mean, hometown Ramirez? bias, obviously. Okay, <laughs> so at least you're honest about it. Let's be honest. I mean, look, I don't watch <laughs> Jose Ramirez every day. I mean, I see the numbers, and they're incredible. And, I mean... He, he could even sneak, he could even get this award because what if, you know, Mookie and, and JD take votes away from each other? Which is a very realistic possibility. A very realistic possibility. Um, I mean, Jose Ramirez, I mean, the fact that he has 40 steals, or he could end up with 40 steals, at 40, be a 40 40 guy, I mean, that's, that's a big deal. Um, again, I, I think the, the big factor. I actually didn't realize for me, he had that many stolen, as many stolen bases as he has until I was like, looking at it the other day. I didn't realize he was. That fleet of foot, I guess. Right. I guess, honestly, and if I'm looking at the overall impact, like I was talking about, sort of the eye test and sort of the intangible, I would say it would be 1A, 1B, Ramirez and, and Martinez, either in either order, with Mookie third. Um, because when, when everybody's this close, I, you either go with who was on the better team, and it's, it's the Red Sox, or who just made like the biggest impact and where would their team be without them. And, you know, I would say the Indians would be worse off than the Red Sox if they didn't have Jose Ramirez. Um, so that's why I would put those two guys ahead of Mookie Betts. But, I mean, honestly, if you, the more you look at Jose Ramirez's numbers, it's hard to make the case that anybody should win the MVP other than him. Yeah, it's pretty, but we just watch J.D. Insane. Martinez on such a regular basis and Mookie that we see what they do, and it's hard to think of anybody else. No shortage of candidates. Un right. Unlike in the, the National League, for the most part this season, has been crap in terms any of Any one of 12 out. guys could win that. Yeah. Just like any one of 12 teams could get the second So any of those spot. three candidates would be far and away the MVP in the National League. Right. Matt Carpenter might, might which, be going away. Which kind of speaks league, to but. how different the American League and National League have been in general this season. It's awesome. Like, I think one great. of the question, uh, like the Nesson uh, poll question for Tuesday night's game, I think it was Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday, uh, w what's the more exciting uh, wild card race, which in my opinion, it's the National League. It's not even because close. There's, yeah, it, because there actually is a race. Right. And, you know, there's that whole, uh, that cluster at the end, what do you call it, the, the Royal Rumble, the right. Royal Rumble of teams at the end. Right. Um, and that's kind of just the way the National League is in general. What would you do but if there was legitimately a four-way tie for the second wild card? Would you have like two separate playoff games? I mean, then you're getting into just mathematical formulas that are way above my pay grade. Right, exactly. Who knows? All right. Uh, all right, one guy in the Red Sox who's you know not in the MVP discussion, but I think pretty quietly is having a really solid season. 
uh, and his, his manager has really been talking about him a lot as of late. Xander Bogarts. Uh, he's been sneaky good. Well, not even – it hasn't really been sneaky, I guess. I would say but, s- sneaky is But relative to, you know, all the fanfare that's surrounding Mookie Betts and J.D. Martinez, I mean, he has been – he's been that guy that's put it together in terms of providing the power, also hitting, you know, or a decent enough average. He's been all around what you pretty much would, it, would hope that Xana Bogarts would be. Is that fair to say? I would say so, yes. And now, yeah, continue. Well, not, no, so it just leads me to – to what Alex Cora brought up over the weekend, um, that he just kind of mentioned it in passing a little bit, that you know, not sure where Xander Bogats ranks among the elite shortstops uh, in Major League Baseball, but he, he considers them to be an elite shortstop. So, I mean, that just got me thinking of where, you know, where I would kind of put Bogarts in the shortstop hierarchy. Whether I'd use that term elite to describe him, which is very subjective, obviously. Um, I don't know. It just I, I thought it was a pretty interesting, interesting label to put on him because it has happened a little bit, a little bit quietly. Well, uh, I think Xander Bogarts is in the discussion of being an elite shortstop simply because there's just not a ton of great shortstops in the league right now, and that's not a slight on Xander Bogarts. But I mean, let, let's think about it. who who would you take above him right now? Lindor for sure. Um, I'll tell you right now. There's probably Trevor Story maybe f- five or six shortstops that I would take at him. Would you take Didi Gregorius ahead of him? I would, I would, I would say I, no. I would, here's who I would I'd take ahead okay. of Xander Bogarts. I'd take Francisco Lindor. Uh, I would take Manny Machado. Uh, I would take uh, Carlos Correa. That's three. I would take Corey Seager. I mean, obviously, he's not playing right now, but yeah, if, I, I, if we're I'd factoring that him one, but in sure. moving forward, I, th- I would take him over Bogarts. Uh, I'd take Trey Turner. I may take Trey Turner over him, so that's five. Is that five right there? Right, but I, I, I agree. And Javi Baez, do you, would you factor him in? Would you consider him as a shortstop? No, I wouldn't. Giving his ability to play there? I wouldn't say he's – no, he's, not, a, he's okay. not. I wouldn't consider him a shortstop. Um, I wouldn't I, – I personally wouldn't go with Seager and Trey Turner's elite shortstop simply because they just – they need to show it a little bit more. Um, they're, I mean, they're really good, don't get me wrong, but I need to see him do it for another season personally. Um, that's why I feel like it's fair to assess Xander Bogarts now at this point because he's in his sixth season, which is crazy to think about. Um, but, you know, it is – and he's done a lot this season to improve know, his case because he's – You wouldn't take Seager? I mean, he's really good. Don't get me wrong. But the fact that he just had Tommy John surgery – he's having Tommy John surgery. I mean, who knows what you're going to get when he comes back. I mean, we'll Seager, see. the upside is, is obvious, though. I, mean, I know, I know. MVP candidate just a couple of years ago. I get the thing Turner, about, I would be a little bit more reluctant because I don't. His offensive upside isn't quite as high as Seager's. You, you're talking more of a, you know, he doesn't have the power. He's more of a speed stolen guy, stolen base yeah. type of guy that you know I think just impacts the game in just a, a different way. I think he's good defensively, but see, yeah, I don't know. Well, and Xander I'm Bogarts has done a lot to improve his case this season. I mean, he's his OPS is eight five six, eight fifty six. That's the best it's been in his career by a long shot. Uh, he's got the best slugging percentage of his season uh, of his career by by about 60 points. He's at 507. Uh, on base percentage is about the best it's been for his career. He's always around 350. Um, batting average is 274. He's had a couple seasons. He had one season where he had 320, another 294. But I think all of us would take the dip in batting average for the increase in home runs. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I and mean, right now he's at 17 homers. He had 21 in 2016. Um, Outside of the power numbers, his numbers over the course of his career have been pretty consistent. You know, like on base percentage numbers, and even when his average has dipped, his on base has, you know, remained pretty steady. Right. Yeah, and uh, I forgot, I didn't realize how good he was in 2016. It goes to show, like, how bad of a second half he really did have. Um, And I'd say the thing that's really helped Xander Bogarts, too, is is his defense has gotten a lot better. I I mean, he pretty much, he makes. I mean, he doesn't make a ton of amazing plays, but he, he now he's a shortstop. He makes all the plays you need him to make. Yeah, he's never going to be that you know real rangy guy. But but I say he's an above one, average shortstop. One fielding error all season, and it was a big one. But yeah, um, yeah, and I would. And the other thing, and so I, I think the fact that he always gets hurt sliding head first frustrates a lot of fans, and me too. You want him to be on the field, but when he is healthy, when he doesn't have an injury like that, I also think you know he's kind of a leader for this team in that he never takes days off. He's out there every day. It's really hard to find a good shortstop, and you know he's producing at at a high enough level, um, and he plays good defense. And you know I think he's not a he's not a real vocal guy. 
He doesn't well, have this huge well, personality, I think but I think he's he's kind of a leader on that team. Th this him. has nothing to do with whether he's an elite shortstop or not, but he's like refreshingly honest. Right. You know what I mean? He seems to like the a good point guy. Where sometimes like, he'll say something, and you're like, wow, he was, that was really just honest. He just seems like a genuine dude, you know? Right. And I, I think <laughs> legitimately he is a true franchise shortstop. And that's, I mean, that's great. Whether or not he's worth the contract that he might end up getting on the open market, which could get up around $200 million, yeah. perhaps. And then when you start talking about the, the other guys at the Red Sox, right. you have to pay here in the coming years. Right. Which you have to pay to keep Andrew Benintendi out of Yankee Stadium. But so, <laughs> I, I, so you would. You would take I would say, Lindor, Machado, Correa. Yes, but I would say, I would say if Xander Bogarts is an elite, he's he's the next the next step up, which is fine. I mean, you can't be elite at every. I'd position. say he's about he's top five. So yeah. if that's what your are you going to do? Go get one of those guys. If that's your so, definition of elite, then okay, he's, he's fringe elite. You know what I mean? Right. Like, it's like you can't. Only so many teams in the league can have an elite shortstop. It can't be thirty-two elite shortstops. So so what? You take the guy that's just a notch below that. If you do want to. Talk war, two shortstops ahead of him in war since the beginning of 2015, Lindor and Machado. Yeah, and he's so. at 2.9, so that's okay. Okay. Good player. It's a good player. He is, good player. He is a good player. Interesting conversation. I thought, you know. Good baseball player. Good, he's a good baseball player. All right, what should it's we get to? guy you want on your side. <laughs> what should we get to next? Uh, I mean, what is. It's, in terms of the this current state of this team, not a lot is really changed it you are getting some positive news on the the injury front it sounds like ian kinsler right on the verge of no uh, i think uh, actually we've heard the opposite so he's not he, i they were talking during the game yesterday and i think core brought it up before the game that he's still not doing anything and now it looks a little bit more out like so, it was originally thought that he was coming back this week and now i think yeah originally it's it was back a little it bit was, yeah it was Wednesday, the off day, Thursday, and maybe Friday. But and Cora has also said that's really because I mean, why push him? Because yeah, I, I think the big thing he brings is speed. He's really good on the base paths, and he's great defensively. So you want him to have all that range and his legs to be under him when it matters. So why rush him back? You're ten up in the division. So you get that going. Eduardo Rodriguez also working his way back. Is the it's something I, I thought of during the the Tuesday night game uh, with Rick Porcello. First of all. Uh, if you're the Red Sox, as much as you love seeing him dive in for a Superman <laughs> yeah. dive in the second base, that's pretty awesome. There's probably a moment, a few like a few minutes later, where you're like, okay, I just hope he doesn't do that again, though. Right. Side <laughs> note on Rick Porcello. You probably don't want to see that again. Side note on Rick Porcello. He's got like a four ERA, and I think it was Jason uh, Jason Master Donato of the Herald had this that his ERA in 19 innings against the Blue Jays this year is like nine something. Yeah. And his ERA versus Everybody else is like 320. So if you take out, he's had a couple really bad games against the Blue Jays, like seven or eight runs. If you take those out, this is a guy who's 15 and five with a 3-2 ERA. That's well, so, a good season. And I think it's, it, it's that's another one that's flown, you know, very far under the radar right. in terms of performances on this team because you factor in how dominant Chris Sale has been uh, with the the offensive production that we mentioned. So. You know, if the playoff start right now, is, is Rick Porcello definitely your game two starter? Or do you, because it's interesting. Because, I mean, Price, David Price obviously pitching well right now, too. And I think you do. Rick Porcello's ERA is about a run higher at home. I would say, and those metrics trust, aside, I would say Rick Porcello is your number three starter because I think you want David Price starting at starting home. Starting at home. That's an, another huge ingredient to this. Thing. I think, and I think it's the biggest ingredient, so I think that's why he would get the game two start. It's because you, you want David Price at home. Um, so, but, you know, we, we've, we've talked a lot Basically, about... Basically, if, especially if, you know, if you are going against, like, the Yankees, let's say. Right. You'd, exactly. I, I trust you don't, Rick Porcello going into Yankee Stadium more than I do David Price. Agreed. I think it's pretty universal there. So. But we've talked a lot. We've been, you know, pretty positive about the Red Sox today. And why wouldn't you be? But uh, is there anything still that you're concerned about with this team? I know I have my concerns. That I'll get to here in a second. But anything for you that you think is a fatal flaw on this team? Because I have it's what I believe is a fatal flaw. There's still the bullpen. I mean, and we've talked about this ad nauseum that just one kind of figuring out where, what role guys are going to sort of fall into. And then you have a wrinkle last night, the, Keith Ember getting the eighth inning, which leading up was to the insane. Playoffs. Yeah, so it's just, it's <laughs> almost like it just feels like they're they're testing certain things in the hopes of finding a formula that works. Because I, I know, and we've, we have talked about before, that just, you know, there are certain guys that have 
a lack of control really when the the pressure seems to ramp up if you're facing a good team where you know suddenly walks become an issue and it, whether right. it's an ingredient of the you know raising the stakes and increasing the pressure i don't know but yeah that would be my number one this is the the bullpen something just the overall fact that they didn't address the bullpen at all right it, 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 and at this point who are you going to get that's going to make a huge difference i don't know if there's anybody i would and you talked about a lack of control and a lack of control in big spots and that for me and you, you watch these games since the yankee series and you even watch those games against the yankees and the walks the red sox bullpen issue out are are to me hugely concerning and what i think could be a potentially fatal flaw that does them in at the end because you know, people look turn to the you know the bullpen ERA. I think it's fifth best in the league. But you know, you're putting a ton of guys on base. You're walking a ton of batters, and you can get away with that when you're facing crap teams like they have all year because the American League is terrible. When you get in the playoffs, you can't be walking guys and giving free passes because good teams are going to bring those runners in. And that leads me to a little sheet I put together. Oh, excellent! So I I, uh, I was wondering when that was going to come into play. So yeah, you come it, in and you. And here it comes. And this will this will lead us into some other discussion where people have been trying to compare so Red Sox what, teams what in the these, past. What are these chicken scratches? Now I have to be, <laughs> I have to be transparent here. I did not completely. The genesis of this was not completely my own. Uh, okay. it, it, 98.5 of sports subs. Tony Maserati kind of talked about this on his show yesterday. Just kind of looking at the Red Sox. Uh, walks per nine inning numbers, and so I decided to go back and look at all the teams from the Red, or some of the teams from the Red Sox past, and see where this team stacks up. So, Richard Doyle. Oh boy. So walks per Guilty. nine inning. Uh, obviously, stat speaks for itself. If you look at the Red Sox teams of the past, the, the one the World Series, 2013, 2007, 2004. Let's look at 2004. And you know, if you look at Baseball Reference, they rank uh, your pitchers by innings pitched. So I'm kind of looking at your top five relievers when I look at this. So for the Red Sox in 2004, they're, let's talk about their top three relievers. Walks per nine inning. Oh, so we're we're we're, we're doing this. Matching we're doing we're going this. back. We're 2004. Okay. We're, we're talking about World Series teams. Is this a World Series team? Is this a world a bullpen okay. that can lead you right. to a World Series? 2004. Keith Folk walks per nine inning. 1.6. Um, Mike Timlin, 2.2. Alan Embry, 1.9. So, and, and to me, the cutoff is three. If you're below three, you're pretty good. You have good control. So let's go up to 2007. Papelbon, 2.3. Okajima, 2.2. Timlin, 2.3 again. Manny Del Carmen, 3.5. And Javi Lopez, 4.0. I mean, Javi Lopez, whatever. 2013, Koji Uehara, 1.1. Elite. Unbelievable. Uh, Tozawa, 1.6. And Craig Breslow, 2.7. This Red Sox team. This Red Sox bullpen. Then their top five relievers, and I'm including Drew Pomerantz in that now. I'm not including Ryan Brazier or Tyler Thornburg because they don't have the innings pitched. Very anxious to see how this Pomerantz, Pomerantz, Pomerantz. walks per Pomerantz, nine inning. Pomerantz's role shakes up, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, walks per nine inning on, your, on your, uh, your top five Red Sox relievers. And remember that on the previous three teams I mentioned, you didn't have a single reliever among the team's top relievers that was above three, except Manny Del Carmen. We can argue about that. Red Sox this year, Craig Kimbrell, 4.1, Matt Barnes, 4.5, Joe Kelly, 4.4, Heath Embry, 4.2, and Drew Pomeranz, 5.6. So your top five relievers are all above four. And to me, four is bad. That's bad. And then you, I mean, you look at the other teams across the American League, your contenders, the Yankees, their only guy above three uh, is Araldis Chapman at five. So that's obviously a big concern for them. Britain is seven, but he just got there. Astros, their top five relievers are under three walks per inning. Indians, their only guy above three is Cody Allen at 3.7. The A's, their only reliever above three is Lou Trevino at 3.7. And the Mariners, their top five relievers all have walks per nine innings under 2.5. So comparing Red Sox World Series teams of the past and your fellow contenders in the American League this year, you by far have the bullpen that issues more walks and has the worst control of any of those teams. And to me, Lack of control out of the bullpen in the postseason is what does the team in. Because the good teams will find a way to manufacture runs in big spots and bring those guys home. You can't just weasel your way out of it like you do against the Orioles. Now, all right, so in your so that's opinion, what I got. <laughs> no, I, it, it, it makes total sense to me. It really does. When you have you have five, top five relievers are over four. That's rough. So do you think that this bullpen this season is – Far worse than say the 04, 07, and 13 bullpens. Like, where does this rank among the demonstrative so power worse. ranking? You think so? Yes. Just from what I just said, I mean, you look at those guys. 
me say what you want about what Tozawa was at the end, but I, we would take 2013 Shinichi Tozawa over any eighth inning guy you have on this team, right? They were in a pretty good spot in 13. It was, it was pretty obvious that they, you know, the role, the roles that they had, Breslow, right. the Taz, the the Koji, and that was it. Taz was nails in the playoffs, and Koji was too. Five. And um, in 2007, Okajima was too, and Papelbon. Okajima, yeah. I, uh, and Manny yeah. Del Carmen, you mentioned him. He was really good. Tim on that season really good. pitched another five, 50 games, had like a three something ERA, and still wasn't walking guys. I forgot Mike Tim was, was on still that so team. good in 2007. Yeah. And then in 2004, you know, Alan Embry was 1.9. People forget how good a control Alan Embry had. Keith Folk was 1.6. Elite control, you have to be because he didn't have a high 90s fastball. He was more of a changeup guy. Um, I mean, I think this bullpen is demonstrably worse than those guys. And I would say, and no disrespect to K Craig Kimbrell, I give Craig Kimbrell breaks because I think, you know, is there how many guys are better than him in the league? I don't know anybody. Maybe Kenley Jansen that you trust more, but that's, that's really it. Um, but I would still put him below Uehara. Uh, Papelbon and Folk in terms of guys I trust in those big moments simply because of the control. You can't walk the leadoff man in, you know, in the ninth inning of the American League Championship Series, Game 7 or World Series or anything like that. You just can't. So what I'm, now I'm trying to extrapolate a little bit more. In terms of the, you know, the three previous World Series winning teams that we mentioned, like which team does this team, does the current version of the Red Sox remind you most of? Because I would probably 2007. say... 2007. Just in terms of... Because that 2007 team was a wagon. They, were, they had a ton of talent, and they were just really, really good. And when you watch them, you're like, this team is better than everybody else. They didn't quite have the same intangible feel to me as 04 and 13 I think did. 07 might be their best team that they've had. Overall, yeah. I mean, maybe 04... Even better. 04 just because Manny was so insanely good. And so that offense was, was just, from top to bottom... Was insane. Was a powerhouse. Uh, you win that many games... In going in a division with like you know, still like the height of the Yankees, you know what I mean? Like they are still pretty legit. Um, yeah, that team was pretty good. In 2007, but there are Josh certain Beckett, things you factor into. So. Like it wasn't like the same. You weren't getting like 99, 2000 Pedro. Like he was like a shell of himself at, during that season, as good as he was at times. Right. Um, and beyond Schilling and Pedro, like. Derek Lowe was a hero in the playoffs, but he was a mess going into the playoffs. Right. People forget, so. yeah. But, I mean, Pedro and Schilling were so nails that it didn't really matter. Yeah. But, to me, I would say this team is m the most like 2007. I would say there's an element of it's a combination of 07 and 13. I think there's a, there's a little 13 in there, too. I think, you know, one thing about that 2013 team, it kind of came out of nowhere. You know, the whole element of surprise, to kind of a thrown-together group after... You know, retooling with the the, the trade the August before. Um, Nobody believed in that team until they won the World Series. And I, f I feel like there's a there's a little bit of that with this team as well. I, you know, I think it's going to take until Game Six of the World Series before you fully buy into them for a lot of the reasons that we touched on. I also think consistency, though. I mean, you look back at that 13 team; they were pretty consistent from start to finish. They were. You know, for as much skepticism as there was about their ability to ultimately win it all. I mean, they were just like from from start to finish winning. Their big thing, I think, that year was just winning winning each series, which is very similar to kind of you know how they've approached this season. Right. If you win each series, you're going to be in a good spot. And I just think it's kind of one of the more amazing things about this year's team is just you know their ability to stop the bleeding at the when things do slightly go off the tracks a little bit. I mean, it is the longest losing streak, three games. They haven't right. lost more than two games in a row. You know, they've lost more than two games in a row only once. Like right. that. They've only had crazy. one three-game losing streak, which is pretty insane. You know, when you look at it more, I'm looking at the 2004 team right now. The starting pitching on this team, can, uh, and a postseason aside, because the David Price postseason thing is such a factor, but, I mean, you look at... The rotation in 04, Schilling, he, had a, he went 21-6 and six with a 3.26. Great season, don't get me wrong, but I mean, Chris Sale, at least in regular season numbers, I'd say is better than Schilling was right. at that time. Yeah, no, definitely. Pedro went 16-9 with a 3.90. It's basically what David Price is giving you. Again, we would probably trust Pedro more. And then Wakefield, 12-10 and 10 with a 4.87. I'd say Purcello's better. And then Derek Lowe had a 5.42, and then you have Bronson Arroyo. So... I mean, if anything, this, this team's rotation might be better, uh, not necessarily in, in the battle-tested sense, but, I mean, you go up to the offense, and I'm just looking at the, the lineup right now. 
I mean, everybody had a good year. It's yeah. crazy. I mean, and Veritek, they, they yeah. were a far different offense, too, you know, relative to this one. That was a team that would outslug you. You know, you, you talk about J.D. Martinez's impact from a power standpoint on the rest of this lineup. I mean, you, it's also you people, were getting that from several areas. I mean, they would just stack. You didn't have, a, you didn't have anybody on the team hit lower than 264. Mark okay. Bellhorn was technically your worst hitter. And people look at, like, remember Mark Bellhorn as if he was horrible and it, he, all he did was strike out? He was struck out 177 times. You guys are way worse now. He hit 264 with 17 homers and 82 RBIs and 88 walks. Very a fine player. He led a the team in walks. <laughs> I mean, Veritek, 296. Kevin Millar, 297 with 18 homers. Mark Bellhorn, like I just said, Bill Miller was 283 with 12 homers. And obviously, Manny, Manny and Ortiz, Damon hit 304. Gabe Cabler, yeah. 272 off the bench. Team, Orlando Cabrera, 294. The current team is a little more, it's, it's going to beat you in a way that's a, a little bit more finesse, I guess. Is right. a way to put it. It's pressure points in the lineup where they really get you. It's Mookie, it's JD. And but then, you know, you, you get, get anything the, out of the bottom. You, you get to the bottom and it's... You know, you're hoping for them to, to turn things over to the top, and then it's like, okay, here we go, we can get this started again. Right. Um, and then, like, the, the whole speed element that reminds me a little bit of cross between 13 when you had Ellsbury stealing, I think, 50 something bases, Shane Victor, right. you know. Um, yeah, so it's. It's interesting, and you just look back on some of these teams. I mean, and even 2007. It was a good team. Michael hit 324. I just think from a talent standpoint, 07 was probably as good as we've seen. It is. Alex Cora. I mean, was you had Josh Beckett in, in top Beckett form. And you know, Dice K. <laughs> John Lester was coming on. coming. coming I don't on think he pitched point. in the playoffs, though, did he? Lester won, in 07 won did the uh, clinching game. Did he? Oh, yeah. No, when was his? It was the year before where you got lymphoma, right? Yeah, I, and I forget. He, and the, yeah, and then he came back. But even if you look at that team, I mean, yeah, you had Josh Beckett, and he was lights out. But then Dice K, we all know what Dice K was all about. Wakefield had a good season, but it was 4.76. Schilling was 3.87 on his way out. And then you had Ju- Julian Tavares get 23 starts. Okay. Yeah, man. And then, so, I mean, again, I think you almost take, I, I think the bullpen was better, but I think you'd almost take th- this version of the Red Sox's 2018, their starting rotation. And then, you know, on the, in terms of batting, it's not as far off as you think it is. I mean, Manny didn't, he, he was only 296 with 20 homers. So, I mean, that's like what Andrew Benintendi's going to do. Honestly, when you look at the numbers the, in terms of offense, this, this Red Sox team might be, might be way better now that you look at it. I mean, the red, that, that team's lows weren't as lows as this team's lineup is. I mean, there was no Bradley or Christian Vasquez hole, per yeah. se which makes a huge difference. Julio Lugo was your, was your weak link. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's why. I, I mean, yeah, you mentioned how good Dustin Pedroia was, how good Kevin Euclid was. Right, Dustin. How yeah. good Mike Lowell was. But even that season. That's a deep team, man. That is a J.D. Drew. They, a very underappreciated J.D. Drew. Right. That's a stack That's team. what I'm saying. You didn't really have any holes in the lineup. That yeah. was the big difference. I think that Eric team might be off the, the most well-rounded. <laughs> Liam O'Pena hit five bombs. And then, oh, yeah, Ellsbury's down there. I didn't even God love him. Ellsbury, that Yeah, they season. got some serious contributions from guys that came up a little later, too. You know, like, he played a role on that. Lester with the clinching game, obviously. So Ellsbury, in, th- in 33 games as a rookie, hit 353. Three that was, like, the, nine a, bases. the combination of, like, veteran talent meets stud prospects coming up, too. Like, right. you just had a, a very talented roster. Right. On the whole. Anyways, so we'll see what happens with this one. But, so... But before we get out of here, the, the final question I just want to toss out there because there, there's been a little bit of, you know, there's been some happenings across the, the league as a whole. So when you look at this right now, because it's pretty clear the Red Sox, as we mentioned, are the best team in baseball. Uh, they, something, it would be a, have to be a colossal collapse in order for them not to win the American League East and, you know, go right to the ALDS. So if you're the Red Sox, which American League team do you least like to face? Just looking at it right now, I guess we can power rank them real quick. Because uh, for a while, I mean, it seemed like the Astros were right up there, um, but think, they've they've yeah. since the beginning of July have really hovered around 500. We've seen the Yankees' flaws up close and personal. So I don't know. Is it still one of those teams, or is there another team that you, um, that's like you should be wary of? I don't know. The postseason is so weird because sometimes it comes down to matchups and also like who's hot going into the in the postseason. Um, for me, I would put the Indians number one. 
because of their bullpen uh, and their starting pitching. Which is, which is strange because, on the whole, their bullpen has sucked for right. most of the season. But, but you I, I think you and I could agree that they're better than the numbers indicate. Right. They added Brad Hand. They, Andrew Miller's back. Right. Which, that's, you know, that's huge. That is huge. You know, you, Cody you, Allen still throws darts even though he's You're taking a bad bullpen kinda... and you're adding Brad, an all-star and closer in Brad Hand and Andrew Miller who's filthy. And like, also the just, biggest thing for the Indians is you know, they're battle-tested. That group's been to a World Series. The battle so tested, I worry about the, them. You have the A's. Assuming Trevor Bauer can come back, you get a one-two punch. That's a big punch. loss for them. Right. Um, with you know him and Kluber, that offense is still good. We talked about how good Jose Ramirez is. Francisco Lindor is a stud. Right. So I put That's them one. Uh, I personally, and I know it sounds weird, I would, I, I kind of want to put the Oakland A's number two because nothing to lose. They're playing with house yeah. money, and if they win that playoff game over the Yankees, they're going to be feeling themselves. They're going to come into Fenway it's, Park ready to mash you. And I'm not saying they're good enough to, but I don't think they're going to be afraid of you. Uh, and you always pain, have to be worried about that. It's just a pain that. in the ass team. It's like right. trying to figure out like why are you good sort of deal. Right, and sometimes those teams can sneak up on you. And then, you know, Astros, Yankees. I just think something about the Astros this year doesn't feel as right. And I'm not saying it's a World Series hangover, but it just feels like it's almost like the Cubs. Like they're going to take, a, they're going to kind of slide back and have a weird year, and then they're going to come back next season. Little, yeah. little banged up. You know, Springer's been out. Carlos Correa coming back, so maybe that gives them a little bit of a boost. But right. I still don't, don't want to. I wouldn't want to see that rotation. And again, a, we talked about battle tested. In obviously, they're the defending series. World Series champs. So I guess I'd go at least want to face the Indians for the reasons that we mentioned, which. It's kind of weird. I mean, they've played in a crap division, so they've been beating right. up on some bad teams. Well, uh, and they looked bad for much of the season. You thought, oh, yeah, the Indians, like, they're going to get in the playoffs, but they're really not as good as they have been. But they've done much better recently. So. And they, they've won a lot of games. So they kind of look like they figured it out. And if they get hot rolling into the postseason, you just worry about them. But you wouldn't face them in the first round anyway. So at least I'd say an Indians, Indians Astros are 1-1A for me in terms of least wanting to see. Then I, I agree I'd with your sentiment about the the A's, but I just it's so hard for me to look at a team that you know their rotation is includes the likes of Edwin Jackson and Trevor Cahill and Brett Anderson. And, it's true they don't. And, yeah, they don't you know, but they played good against for me the Red to, Sox to this be year. like you know what's going. on? I mean their bullpen's good, but it's just a Mariners weird team. don't scare you. I guess I just look at it and I put a little more faith in the sustainability of the. Yankees bullpen to be good. Right, I agree. For them to be good at all. But, all right. We still got a lot of the regular season before we get into this. So. Lock and change. You can still Lock blow and change. Game guys lead. could break their legs. Guys could come down with the flu. Um, guys could get suspended, pop for PEDs. Real quick, do you, think, <laughs> Who knows? do you think the team has a legitimate chance of breaking Seattle's record of 116 wins? No. <laughs> They're kind that, of sneaking no, up. And, and I thought, like, I thought, like, I looked into this uh, maybe like a week or two ago to try and like maybe make a case or just try and sell myself on the idea that it could come, it, they, they could make a run at it just because I'd like to see it. They're on pace to tie it. But the more I just look at them like that, that is such a crazy record. I think the ultimately what's going to be the difference is you got to face the Astros and the Yankees six times. That, so that you, they, they you go have the ability, they're, they're so far and away ahead of everybody else that they don't have anything to play for. Like they can rest guys. Right. I hope they don't rest guys because I'd like to see them firing on all cylinders going into the playoffs. I worry about teams kind of you know easing off the gas as the postseason nears, and then you face a team that just won a wild card game, and then you know yeah. they're ready to go. But conversation for another day. We'll worry about that. In two what months. an insane record, though. It is. I mean, well, they're over fifty games for over five hundred. <sighs> they could well, lose every game the rest Mariners. of the way, and they would still have a winning record. Yeah. I don't know how the Mariners won that many games that year. They were good, but, I mean, Ichiro played out of his mind. But their rotation, I mean, that was wasn't great. Kazuhiro Sasaki, just locking <laughs> it down. Just a weird team. Everything kind of came together. Yeah. Brett All right. Boone, Jay Buna. Well, let's get out of here. Okay. Um, Dakota, it was a pleasure talking to you. It's I appreciate you bringing the stats this week. And just, you know, I, I'm You had trying. a little pep in your step when you came in this morning. Maybe it was the big barrel of uh, big jumbo jar of cheddar cheese balls that I had sitting on my <laughs> desk. But you we took don't need to get into well. those. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I've been trying to find a way to uh, articulate all season long why I don't believe in the bullpen. And uh, oh, there you go. There I go. It took somebody That's else it. to give you a kick in the pants. And I think we there. can, without a doubt, say now that the evidence has been laid forth that I am right and everyone that disagrees with me is wrong. Oh, boy. All right. So. Well, we're going to get out of here on that note. If you'd like, you could follow, uh, obviously, follow at Nesson. You can follow me at, 
at the Ricky Doyle on Twitter. You at at Dak Randall. Sure am. Um, you know, someone we, after we the last podcast, internet, someone so. tweeted at at Dak Randall and said I was a speed bump. They want, they asked you how you deal with that speed bump. And really, I so I've I, yet to come up with an explanation. So <laughs> if I didn't respond, I apologize. But yeah, it's just because I'm still grasping the trial. All right, well, we're out of here. We'll see you uh, next week. Uh, all right. All right. Sounds good. See you later, everyone.